All right, so hopefully you can all see and hear us okay. We've had um, Zoom have a little technical dif difficulties for us, so please bear with us if anything happens. Uh, I do see attendees starting to join, so I'll just give it another moment or two to, uh, to let everyone in. All right, so I will get started. So good morning and afternoon, everyone. We are super excited to have you all participating in Kila's three-day virtual conference that we're calling Plugged In. If you attended our morning session so far, welcome back. And if you're just tuning in now, well, welcome and thanks for joining us. Before we begin this session, I just wanted to go over a few housekeeping details with you all. So first, uh, the session will be about an hour in length with about 10 to 15 minute questions questions at the end. Um, we'll, we encourage you to ask questions throughout the presentation and then in the in the Q&A box and then we will get to them at the end. And all of the sessions will be recorded and you'll be receiving the recording along with the slide deck uh, by the end of this week. All right, and with that, I'd like to introduce and extend a huge warm welcome to three amazing speakers who were supposed to present together at N10's NTC conference. Oh, we just went out there. Can everyone hear and see me okay? I hope so. Yeah. Um, perfect. Okay, sorry. Um, so I was just introducing um, three wonderful speakers who were supposed to present together at N10's NTC conference um, that has unfortunately been canceled this year. Um, but thankfully, instead, they've generously offered to lead this session online with all of us today. So with that, I'd like to welcome Najid Kassam, who is the founder and CEO of Kila. Um, sorry. Okay, perfect. We got the screen up there. Now you can see Najid Kassam. Um, and then we also have Justin Walker, who is an entrepreneur, humanitarian, and board treasurer of Global Conservation Corp. And we also have Kate Vanelli, who is a conservation scientist and program director of Global Conservation Corp. So they'll be speaking on searching for wild data in your Dodor database, how AI is the best safari guide. And thank you all so much for, um, for being here with us today and I'll pass it off to you now. Uh, thanks so much, Mel. Um, really appreciate the opportunity to speak today. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's an honor to be sharing the next hour or so with you today as Mel and her beach scene. Um, introduced. My name is Najib Kassam. I'm a recovering lawyer, a struggling technologist, and someone who's spent about 30 plus years in and around the nonprofit sector. Before we begin, I just wanted to share that uh, I hope and pray all of your families, your teams, and all the folks in your communities are safe and healthy during these times. Like Mel, forget about what's going on, pretend you're at the beach, and let's get excited about our topic today, where we get to talk about data and artificial intelligence. Now, I wanna tell you a little story about my wife. She's about 30 times as intelligent as I am and at least three times more interesting. She's also a proud Stanford graduate. And one day she showed up to a date with the t-shirt that said, talk data to me. And I knew I was in love. And this story taught me two things. One, that I married the perfect woman. And two, that today's topic can be fun. Today, I get to share the stage with two wonderful human beings from the Global Conservation Corps. Thank you, Kate and Justin, for sharing your wisdom and your story. The question I want to answer for you today, or ask with you rather, is why should you care about artificial intelligence? Chances are you've heard of it. Maybe you've dismissed it as too high tech. Maybe it's something you've actively avoided, thinking it's just a fad, it'll come and go, like so many technologies in the past. I'm here to share with you definitively that artificial intelligence and all its many manifestations is not a fad and is not something that's gonna come and go. Did you know that as a society, we've been working to, to develop AI in various forms since 1956. That's more than 60 years. And in the same year, the videotape recorder was invented. And only one year after McDonald's opened its doors. 
And while 1956 was the year the term artificial intelligence was coined, truthfully, it is merely a part of work that was started by classical philosophers, namely understanding human society as part of a system which follows rules and patterns. For millennia, as a society, as a civil, uh, throughout the civilizations, we've sought to understand ourselves better. AI and the systems behind it are simply a continuation of this long tradition. Thus, the technology we build around artificial intelligence is a tool which we are using to further make sense of our environment as species. It's not that different from the way a monkey uses a tool to catch food, the way a baby inspects an object and then uses it to get something she wants. Layer on many centuries of learning and development and a couple of awesome data scientists and you arrive at today where AI as a tool is increasingly embedded into so many parts of our lives. Now, enough with the philosophizing. Let's talk about our sector, the nonprofit sector. Unfortunately, nonprofits are too far behind in adopting and leveraging AI technology. I know AI can help us all change how we work. I know it will allow us as a sector to empower our organizations and ultimately empower our communities better. Thus, we all, everyone on this webinar, has a responsibility to our donors, to our constituents, to our beneficiaries, and to ourselves to get out of our comfort zones and actively look to rectify this missed opportunity. I call upon all of you today to lead your organizations and our sector in adopting AI and integrating it into how we work. Now, this may all sound scary, but it's not. Data-driven decisions and AI are accessible to even the smallest of organizations. You don't need a computer scientist on your team, and you don't need to go back to school. My goal at the end of this presentation is to give you a foundation on AI and help you begin adopting it into your workflows every day. I'm incredibly excited to be sharing our digital stage with Kate and Justin from Global Conservation Corps. They use and want to increasingly use technology and artificial intelligence to scale and streamline program efficiencies in their work every day. Today, they'll share their perspective on technologies emerging and vital role within wildlife conservation and education. They serve as a case study and we'll talk about an app that they're developing to aid in data collection and decision making in their work every day. Kate and Justin are generously sharing their time and wisdom today, and we are honored to have them. Welcome, Kate and Justin. Thanks so much for that great intro, Najid. We really appreciate this opportunity to talk a little bit about what we are super passionate about here at Global Conservation Corps, which is wildlife conservation and education. So also, I just want to say a big thanks to you and your team at Kela for making our lives at GCC easier in so many ways. So Global Conservation Corps is a nonprofit with the mission to bridge the gap between communities and wildlife. We work with youth in areas of conservation priority to promote conservation education and jobs within the wildlife economy. But why is this important and how does this tie into tech and AI? Well, I'm going to tell you a story. So my name is Kate Vanelli, like Najib so kindly introduced, and I'm the program director for the Future Rangers program at Global Conservation Corps. And I, my defining personality characteristic is that I'm obsessed with cheetahs. Uh, they're the reason I got into conservation. I've loved them since I was five years old. I drew pictures of them. I talked about them all the time. I knew every fact. I watched them on National Geographic Channel. And I wanted to grow up and work with cheetahs one day. And I'm one of those really lucky people that got my dream job after college. I moved to Namibia and I worked in cheetah conservation. And I, today I want to tell you a story about some of my favorite animals that really shaped my decision making in my conservation career. I was going to tell you a story about this cheetah. Her name is Zinzi, 
and she's incredible. Her story really illustrates the issues that wildlife across our whole world are facing. But her story is a sad one. And I think right now we could all use a happy story. So I'm going to tell you a success story about one of my favorite cheetahs. <laughs> this is Jacomina. And the significance of her story really comes from knowing some background information about cheetahs. They need a ton of space. They need space to hunt. They need space to have their cubs. Um, they're not particularly social with each other, so they need their own space as well. And many times cheetahs are pushed out of national parks, protected areas, because they're competing with other predators like lions, hyenas, leopards, and they're built for speed. They're not built to fight. So a lot of cheetahs are living in close proximity to people. And if you were like me, this is how you imagined Africa growing up. I used to watch The Lion King. It was the first movie I ever saw in theaters. And I saw this vast landscape filled with animals with no people. And my six-year-old self was so excited that something like this existed in the world. So yeah, no development, no people, just wildlife, fields, happy place for six-year-old Kate. But that's not the reality. This is a picture I took of a leopard not too long ago when I was in South Africa working on my National Geographic grant for Global Conservation Corps. The leopard's walking down a road and you can see to the right there, there's a game fence. And this is the norm in a lot of places. Humans and wildlife are living alongside each other. They're competing for resources, they're competing for space for development, and they're competing for land for food in some cases. And so as the human population grows, this is becoming a bigger and bigger problem for wildlife. Wildlife generally does really well on its own in the wild, left alone by people, they thrive, especially cheetahs. But wild places are fast disappearing and human populations are only growing. We are currently in the middle of the sixth mass extinction, which means that species are going extinct at a much faster rate than they ever have in human history. And this is a scary time for people like me who love wildlife. And frankly, it's a scary time for people as a whole, the human population, because we depend on wildlife. Our survival depends on the existence of wildlife. So this is important. We need to fix this problem. What does this mean for wildlife conservation and people? Well, back to Jacomina. She was a victim of human wildlife conflict. And what this means is in that competition for resources, for space, for food, there's usually a loser. And unfortunately in this scenario, the loser was her mother. Her mother was shot in a human wildlife conflict situation and she was left an orphan. She was rescued at a young age, lucky for her, and we were able to give her a safe space, safe space to grow up. She was orphaned young but not so young that she didn't keep her wild side. She didn't keep her, she didn't lose her fear of people. And this is extremely valuable for cheetahs to have because it ensures their survival in the wild. If they can avoid people, they'll probably be okay. This is the same case for coming to you from the Rocky Mountains today. The mountain lions here, they're living alongside us, but we never see them. And that's one of the key elements of their survival in the wild. So as Jacqueline grew up, we collared her, we released her, and we tracked her. And as a side note, since we are talking tech today, conservation as a field is no stranger to technology. We use tech like this satellite radio collar here, you can see in the picture, to gather information about how wildlife uses space and sometimes how wildlife is interacting with humans. This is really important for us as conservationists because we need to get an idea of the best way to design conservation interventions to aid the species that we're trying to protect. So this gives us very valuable data in that conservation space. So Jacomina was released into a reserve that was fenced off from farms and people. Because of this, she grew up not having to worry about human wildlife conflict, unlike her mother. She had cubs, those cubs grew up. We collared those cubs, that Shandy there in the picture, uh, she was the cub in the last picture on the right, a little bit bigger there. We collared them, we tracked them, and guess what they did? 
they grew up and had cubs of their own. And as a conservationist, this is probably the most exciting thing you can ever witness in the wild. It's how wildlife is supposed to function. It's out there, it's doing its thing, having cubs, creating more cheetahs. This is a multi-generational success story, and it was something so cool to be a part of. This is my happy story for you guys. However, this kind of story is becoming more and more rare. And many animals, including a lot of cheetahs that I knew and loved, weren't as lucky as Jack and Nina. These wild, safe spaces are small and scattered, and they're not as common as you would think. Most wildlife is sharing space with an ever-increasing human population. And this is the case across our entire world. If you look at Colorado, where I'm talking to you from now, we have mountain lions only because they're so good at avoiding people. Unfortunately, we've lost our wolves and we've lost our grizzly bears because the human population doesn't have a lot of tolerance for large wildlife such as that. So how do we make sure humans sharing space with wildlife, one, accept the presence of that wildlife, and two, benefit from that wildlife? In my mind, it's all about education. That's the answer. And this is where the Future Rangers program comes in with Global Conservation Corps. We need to plan for a world where wildlife and humans are sharing space. Appreciation for wildlife has to start young and the presence of live wildlife has to provide benefits to the people living alongside that wildlife. So this is why we're working to not only provide conservation education in communities adjacent to high conservation priority areas such as Kruger National Park in South Africa, but we're also trying to aid these learners in their quest for local employment within the wildlife economy. And this is important. The reason this is important is because these kids are growing up with no opportunity to connect with the wildlife just on the other side of the fence, almost in their own backyard. And this isn't fair. Every kid should have the opportunity to form that love and connection with wildlife and wild spaces that I had with cheetahs when I was five. And every kid should have the opportunity to go in a career that can help them support their families while they follow through with their love of nature and wildlife. We're creating leaders in this space that have an appreciation for wildlife. And that's where the conservation starts and ends. So this is where our tech inputs come in. I recently received a grant from National Geographic to design our monitoring and evaluation of our future rangers program. And this is essentially a way for us to make sure that the program is actually having the impact that we want it to have. And that if it's not, we can go back and change certain elements to make sure that it is. So through the design of our on the ground monitoring and evaluation program plan, we noticed a pain point. Day to day student tracking and data collection. Our staff on the ground was writing down what they were doing, they were tracking their students, but this was all on pieces of paper, it was time consuming, it was disorganized, and as a global team, we really need the data to be organized in one place and accessible to people around the world who are working on this. So the problem we identified was monitoring our program and students accurately and efficiently. Our solution that we created was an app to make daily monitoring easy and fast. Reliable, organized, and scalable data collection was our first step. So this app does some two really important things. It creates a portfolio of evidence for each of these students. So they're going through, they're getting all this experience, and for the first time ever, it's logged so that they can use it as they graduate this program to approach the sector that they most want to work in within the wildlife economy and say, look at all this experience I've had. Look at how my teachers have recommended me for this. Look at how our facilitators have noticed I have skills in this area. I have tangible proof that I can offer you so you can hire me locally and that the money from the tourism industry can come back into my community and we can all benefit. That's huge for conservation. And not only does this tech innovation help our students directly, but it also frees up time. And time is so valuable in this era where we seem to be running out of time. So it frees up time for our staff to do what really matters. 
they're not filling out shuffling papers anymore. They're not spending hours organizing and writing. They're spending hours connecting kids with wildlife and fostering that love of nature that all people deserve to have. This is how we save the cheetah. This is how we save wildlife. And the tech that we're working with has only made this easier for us. So thank you so much. I'm going to pass it off to Justin. And he's going to tell you a little bit about what this means for AI and tech in the nonprofit space. Thanks. Awesome. Thanks so much, Kate. Really appreciate it. And again, to the Kila team, thank you guys so much for giving us this opportunity. Um, I think ultimately, like what gets me excited as the um, treasurer for the Global Conservation Corps is knowing the work that I had to put into um, in past years into putting uh, data into our system and then going in and analyzing it. And now with the partner that we have in Kila, um, we have an amazing uh, just platform that allows recommendations to come to us to engage our donors. And that's kind of like how we have this uh, symbiosis and what we're doing with our future Rangers app is that in the same way that Kila uh, helps us by giving us recommendations and providing great insights into the data set that we have, we can do the exact same thing with our future Rangers app, as Kate mentioned, to match graduating students um, from these classes over a period of time that then we don't have to go back individually and sort through that data where we use AI instead to actually give us these recommendations and these suggestions as to what the child, uh, the graduate may be best suited for, whether it's um, working specifically directly with animals or whether it's actually in the tourism industry or whether it's starting a small business in their community. Ultimately, what we want to do is, gr is grow with our AI to be able to um, have it become more and more intelligent over over time and then also become better and better at recommending and giving um, suggestions to us so that we can place our graduates in better positions and better places um, as they go on into the world after they graduate out of the Future Rangers program. And I think ultimately like it's it's just an amazing opportunity to be able to use technology that we know is present in so many different places today um, and we've embraced it and we're using it and it's something that's um, honestly making our lives more simple, even though it may be something complicated to understand how it works. It is, uh, it's actually something that we can tangibly use on a day to day basis and uh, it's really, really made our lives here on the administrative side of, of running Global Conservation Corps much, much easier. Um, both from our implementation on the ground and then also having another piece of technology like our CRM that we're using with uh, with Kila for uh, the ability to look into our data set for our donors and in our nonprofit space. So thanks so much, guys, and I'll pass it back to Najee. Thanks so much, Kate and Justin, for sharing your story. Uh, those photos were something else, Kate. Um, I don't know, for most of you don't probably don't know this, but my family is actually from Tanzania. Uh, my parents were born there. I was born here in, in Vancouver, but I've been back uh, to, to East Africa and, and the beauty in the wildlife is, is literally unlike anything in the world. So it made me miss home. So thanks, Kate. Um, what's really interesting about the GCC is that their technology is for a very specific use case. It's being custom built and will empower them to do more with their existing resources. A couple of things to note though, your tech and our sector's tech doesn't have to be custom built. In fact, there are so many of the out of the box powered solutions using AI that can help all of us. Secondly, even if we need custom built solutions, there are lots of ways to partner with amazing people and organizations who can help build specific use case tools like GCCs without completely breaking the bank. I want to start the conversation we're about to have around how each of us can go, out, go about building or finding tech solutions for our work. But let's be clear, the starting point has nothing to do with technology and everything to do with a problem. We must all start this journey, not with AI or data, but rather with the question, what problem do we need to solve? Or put another way, what do I need to know to help my team work better? Do we need more insights? Maybe we need predictions or forecasting. Do we need to see or visualize our data better? Maybe we need to understand our donors more deeply. 
Or maybe we just need to track our wildlife and the communities supporting it better. Whatever the question we begin with, searching for and understanding these problems will lead us to finding technology that will increase our capacity to do work better. In the remaining time I have today, I want to talk about three important things. One, AI, data, and intelligence isn't scary. In fact, it's something you can start using tomorrow. You don't need to be a computer scientist or an engineer or a data scientist to use these tools. You just need to be you and have the will and wish to continue to grow. This tech will become part of your everyday process and you're gonna fall in love with it, but you've gotta give it the chance. Two, this tech won't replace your job. I know this, I know this may be a worry for some of us, but this isn't the movies. This is a tool to help us. Slow cookers, for example, don't replace chefs. They just allow even me to make delicious soup. When my wife is hungry and she's nine months pregnant, so this isn't infrequent. I still need to pick up the ingredients, measure things out, and put them all in the slow cooker. No tool can do that for me, but a tool can certainly help. You can think of AI-driven software as a sword and you are the valiant knight wielding it with precision. In short, this technology is not about replacing people. It's about creating more capacity for all of us. Three, finally, innovation is accessible and we're all in this together. We are so lucky because so many organizations, companies, and institutions are working every day to build data-driven technology and AI. Equally as important, there are tons of folks leading in this space and working to ensure that these tools aren't only for large elite organizations, but are accessible to all of us. So how do you become a tech-enabled AI-driven organization? Let's look at the Heart and Stroke Foundation as an example. Did you know that the Heart and Stroke Foundation have been at the forefront of empowering their organization with technology for 60 years, time and time again, they have embraced technology as it has become available and reimagined and retooled how they work. For example, in their fundraising efforts, they consistently have consulting teams working with technology to help them identify donor markets, analyze their fundraising health, and helping them adopt tools in order to meet their projections. This is crazy to think about, but the Heart and Stroke Foundation knows when you, as a donor, are likely to give, how much they should ask for, and, whatever, and a ton of other data to help maximize your donations. This feels a little crazy, right? Actually, it's not. It's a perfect example of artificial intelligence. They simply use tools to pull reports that offer them the right insights. Empowered with these data-driven insights, they are able to better engage their donors. Now, let's be clear. It is almost certain that they don't know much about, more about the AI and their technology than you do. Their consultants have figured out. Yet, the tech enables them to raise more money and support heart health more because they trust in and leverage their tools. With additional donor dollars raised, they are able to build a stronger organization, create more impact, and then raise more money. This positive cycle is undoubtedly helped by their powerful technology. Now, most of us are probably thinking, okay, but we're not the Heart and Stroke Foundation. We don't have money for that. I'm not saying you need these kinds of significant resources. Quite the opposite, you don't but you can still adopt the same kinds of tools that Heart and Stroke organization. In fact, I would argue that if you don't adopt the kinds of things the larger players in our space are using and have been using for decades, you are gonna fall behind. And I don't want that, and you don't want that. Now, or can give you thousands of dollars of time back a month at a fraction of the cost, of course you're gonna adopt it. Why wouldn't you? Save time, more funding, increased capacity, whatever it is, 
It's a recipe for a happier, healthier nonprofit to steal a line from one of our other speakers that plugged in Beth Cantor. So now that I've convinced you of its importance, or at least I hope I have, I want to demystify AI a little bit so that you can leave here knowing just enough to feel empowered and not so much to feel overwhelmed. What is artificial intelligence? I wanna be clear, I'm not an engineer, I'm a lawyer, but I have become a student of technology, maybe a B student. But my research and conversations with engineers and technical experts have led me to understand AI in pretty simple terms. Artificial intelligence is any technology such as software that can demonstrate some of the behavior that we consider to be associated with human intelligence. The range of uses is huge. It could be learning, problem solving, planning, predicting. Now, traditional software has done exactly what we have programmed to do, it to do, it's kind of what we've told it to do. Nothing more, nothing less. It follows exactly the script we made for it, and deviating from that script was never really a possibility. Artificial intelligence is a step beyond this. The software is developed to one very specific thing, maybe voice recognition or music selection. This software is also, however, taught how to learn to do things better. And over time, its predictions about voice recognition or its suggestions about music selection get better and better. It learns and is able to do better. We see this so commonly in recommendations about what to watch on Netflix next or what Amazon wants us to buy next. These are examples of, of, of AI-driven software tools. The more data these tools see or process and the more practice they get, the more accurate the recommendations get. Now, let's be clear about something. These AI-driven tools can only do the one task they are programmed to do. They just get better and better at it with more practice. We could now start talking about how machine learning, which underpins this kind of AI, actually works. But one, I don't really understand it that much. And two, I promise not to overwhelm you. So if you're intrigued and want to learn more about this, I recommend watching a 20 minute YouTube video entitled, But What is a Neural Network on YouTube? It's simple, clear, and very cool. I'll make sure we send this link to you in the follow up email after today's session. Now, at least somebody here is thinking, what about the AI in the movies where the computer suddenly begins thinking for itself and takes over the world with some evil plot to end humanity? At least for now, this is the stuff of Hollywood. And while I'm sure someone's trying to build machines that learn anything and everything, as far as we know, this is still decades and decades and decades away. So to summarize, the AI you need to know about in order to revolutionize your nonprofit is simply a type of software that can learn, plan, problem solve, or predict a very specific set of things it is designed to do. For example, it could give you insight into your donors, their fundraising habits, and what it predicts you should do to maximize their support for your organization in the coming months or years. Not too scary anymore, is it? Now, let's dive in and look at some examples of AI that are used frequently today, both inside and outside our sector. Use case one, lead scoring. A lot of sales-based companies rely on a concept called lead scoring in order to streamline their pipelines and ensure their sales teams are the most effective they can be. Chances are, if you have ever bought software, you know, they've probably used lead scoring to help evaluate you. What is lead scoring? Lead scoring is a predictive analytic that relies on machine learning in order to give a user a deep working knowledge of their prospects and which, out of those potential customers, are most likely to buy the user's product. Knowing who to target and who not to target can save a user both the time and the resources she would have spent nurturing leads, which, according to the data, would not be likely to convert into sales. The trends and patterns 
that already exist inside a sales organization's databases are used to build a model that can, that can make accurate predictions about new customers using data already at their disposal. In the hands of an ambitious sales team, this information is invaluable. Data and predictive tools like lead scoring helps them know who to target, when to ask, and how to phrase their messaging, factors that undoubtedly lead to better conversations and more sales. Thankfully, for our sector, the lead scoring concept can and has been applied to donors to help nonprofits raise more money. While today, I'm not here to talk much about what we do at Kila, I'm very proud to say our organization is at the, the forefront of using AI in our sector and has been inspired by things like lead scoring and applied it to nonprofits. Kila has a host of AI-driven insights embedded into the software platform, but the two clearest uses of AI in Kila are the smart ask and donor readiness tools. One of the great advantages of AI is that it can process huge amounts of data amazingly quickly, much faster than any human. In the nonprofit world, this means you can use AI powered tools to go through previous donations, attendance of events, volunteer records, whatever, in order to get a true understanding of your supporters giving history and interests. Kila, for example, has built tools that harness this and by giving you insights into valuable information, they're able to help you. Things like how much to ask a donor, when to solicit a donation, and what campaigns a donor might be interested in. There's a ton of research that shows when asking a donor for a donation, you can significantly increase the likelihood of receiving a donation if you ask at the right time of year and for the right amount. Powerful AI fundraising tools should completely take the guesswork out of these questions. So, how exactly do these things work, for example, in Kila? Let's use donor readiness as an example. Donor readiness tells you how likely your donor is to donate within the next couple of weeks. The software in Kila calculates donor readiness using a machine learning algorithm that analyzes an organization's contact interactions, giving history, and even variables like location or weather. Now, no software can tell you with certainty exactly when the ideal time to ask for a donation is. For a fundraiser, personal knowledge and intuition will always help govern when to ask. These, combined with the appropriate AI-driven tools, such as those in Kila, can make every fundraiser's life easier and their asks more successful. Our next case study is, to me, one of the most impressive and noble applications of artificial intelligence that I've ever seen. The Crisis Text Line, an amazing organization working to support mental health, uses an artificial intelligence powered algorithm to predict and help prevent suicide risk. Amazing, right? But how does it work? The organization worked with data scientists and engineers to help to train a machine learning model using conversations tagged with the word suicide by the organization's crisis counselors. By analyzing more than 65 million text messages, the AI model was able to recognize what words are most statistically associated with a high risk of suicide. They were able to teach the algorithm the difference between high risk texts, for example, I feel awful, I feel like driving off a bridge, and those that are less urgent, such as, I lost a friend to suicide two months ago, and I don't think I'll get ever get over it. Thanks to this tool, the organization can prioritize high-risk messages, which re has resulted in a 52% decrease in false alarm. This has allowed the crisis text line to amazingly service 94% of high-risk texters in five minutes. Considering that every minute of response time matters, this is a game changer for the crisis text line and a beautiful example of how artificial intelligence is helping our sector positively impact the world. My final example of AI driven tech in our sector is about how the Children's Society uses a chatbot in their fundraising work. 
The Children's Society of the United Kingdom set up a chat book bot on their Facebook page in order to see whether visitors would be interested in attending upcoming fundraising events. Supporters can ask the bot up to 50 pre-programmed questions, such as, tell me where to set up a fundraising page, or have you received my donation? In fact, AI-powered chatbots are increasingly common in the nonprofit sector because they can alleviate large administrative burdens. So how does this chatbot work? Honestly, it's pretty simple. Any organization can set up a chatbot to answer basic questions, help users update their information in their database, or even sell tickets for a particular event or campaign. And as supporters are spending more time online, they are becoming increasingly accustomed to instantaneous replies, something that many nonprofits have struggled with from a capacity standpoint. Instead of deploying an army of volunteers or paid staff, these organizations can opt for a chatbot that can have conversations with their constituents 24 seven, regardless of office hours, time zones, or even holidays. It's really cool because chatbots can even be programmed to communicate in different languages. And the stats don't lie. Live chatting software has a 73% satisfaction rate for customer interactions, nonprofits included. 40% of millennials say they interact with chatbots on a daily basis. That's crazy, actually. 64 percent of users say a chatbot's 24-hour service is the most enticing feature of investing in a chatbot. Because we don't know when our donors are going to give. They might wake up at 2 in the morning inspired to make a donation. And if they have questions, a chatbot can help to answer some of them. But the craziest piece of data I'll share today is it is forecasted that 85 percent of consumer interactions will be handled without human involvement over the next couple of years. To me, a chatbot is an amazing example of how to easily introduce AI into our organizations to increase capacity. My thesis today has been simple. Leveraging AI will allow us all to exponentialize our existing resources, allowing us to work within our organizations more effectively and more efficiently. AI can change an organization without having to revolutionize how we work. As I've shown today, AI doesn't need to be scary. It's not putting our jobs at risk. And it can be and should be accessible to any organization of any size. Fundamentally, I strongly believe that artificial intelligence will help decrease the stress and overwork that is so pervasive in the nonprofit sector. Technology can and will help each of us. It will allow us to create capacity, eliminate many of our mundane tasks and manual analysis, and ultimately, and most importantly, allow us to focus on the impact that we are so passionate to make. Thank you. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, um, everyone. That was really, really insightful. And we actually do have a few questions that came in. Um, so the first question is, looks like it's for Kate and Justin. Um, they're asking, it's an anonymous, um, what would you recommend to other nonprofits looking to move into the tech space based on your experiences? I guess I can take this one, Kate, you can chime in as well. Um, I think ultimately one of the biggest things that, that we, I, that I would say a takeaway for me personally as being involved in the whole process of creating future arrangers and then also using technology um, in our organization is like trying to keep it simple. Um, not worrying about so many things, but just trying to focus on your mission has really helped us with future rangers. Um, because you can always get a good foundation built and then add things to it. Um, whereas if you get too cloudy and too busy and too many things put in all at one time, then it does get to be 
a bit difficult to manage it all. Um, and we are a small nonprofit. Um, we're growing and um, definitely adding more and more uh, features and people to the team all the time and our capacity is growing, but keeping it simple has been, I think would be what I would, would suggest for getting into technology. Kate, do you have anything else to add? No, I think you said it definitely identifying a pain point with your, in your system and then working around that to solve a problem and keeping it simple. Like Justin said, is it's been really rewarding. Thanks, you guys. Um, so the next question is coming in from Phil. He's asking, how exactly can the lead scoring concept be applied to nonprofits? So I believe that was what Najid was talking about. And how does it work, uh, Phil is asking. Well, thanks for your question. Uh, it's a good one. Um, so, you know, the way that a sales organization uses, you know, a, you know Salesforce or HubSpot or whoever it might be uses lead scoring is to take all these factors and understand who's a likely purchaser. So the way that that can and is applied in the nonprofit sector is taking all these factors, probably pretty similar factors to be really honest, and looking at who is likely to be a donor, right? So, you know, who's likely to donate in the next two weeks or who's got a high precondition of giving again, or who's, um, you know, who, who should I spend my resources and time engaging with and stewarding with because they're a high likelihood to give. Just like lead scoring is about who's likely to buy, donor scoring or donor readiness or donor engagement scores are all about who is likely to give. And obviously every piece of tech you use, uh, Kila is different from, from others, are going to have different sort of criteria, but my gut is that most of them are looking at giving history, giving ability, um, 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 duration and, and, um, and longevity of giving, previous pledge amounts, engagement and interaction with the organization. You know, oh, I'm not a data scientist, a whole host of other things, but those factors are what's gonna help an organization's tech determine whether somebody's either likely to give or give again or give imminently. I hope that answers your question. Wonderful, yeah, that's great. Um, so just, oh, found it. Um, so another person is asking, it's also anonymous, um, is there a limit for AI in the nonprofit space? If machine learning continues to improve technology, what's your prediction uh, for fundraising? It's a good question. Um, if I knew the answer to that, I'd probably have figured it out already and built it, right? But uh, I, I think, I, you know, I, I'm bought in. Uh, and I, I want to be honest with you, I'm not a tech guy. I still write with a fountain pen every day. I mean, my team, Mel included, makes a lot of fun of me about it. And so, um, but, uh, you know, I see AI as the ultimate capacity builder, the ultimate companion, the ultimate co-pilot assistant. You take your choice of words. And so to me, the sky's the limits. But there are two things that are going to determine and predict whether our sector truly embraces it. One, that people keep people, organizations, companies, whatever it might be, keep innovating and invest in innovating and in how we can continue to build AI. So whether you're Justin and Kate and you're bu building it into your tools per personally or specifically for your organization or you're somebody like Kila or whoever it might be, that's building it into the everyday processes of, of a CRM, for example. I think institutions need to keep investing in and innovating around the space. And the second factor that's gonna to lead to how adopted it is, 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 um, is whether we take a chance on it, whether we as a sector open ourselves to, be, to being able to truly use it and embrace it and engage with it. You know, I, I sit on the board of a big university, uh, of, of one of their, um, their boards, and I learned that this, they have a multi-billion dollar endowment and they have, tons of data scientists on their, I mean like handfuls of data scientists on their teams building models and, 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 and using artificial intelligence to help them understand how to ask their alumni and their former students and whatever it might be to, to give. So big organizations are doing it and they're gonna continue to drive the bus on this. I hope that folks um, and organizations and institutions 
invest in making sure the resource is accessible to all nonprofits. Because remember, 80% of nonprofits are small and medium. And so for this, for AI to truly reach its potential in the nonprofit sector, it needs to be accessible to small organizations and, and, and small organizations, you know, like the one where I sit as the executive director, uh, the Better Canada Initiative, we have to adopt it and we have to have confidence that it's the right thing to do. Great answer, Najid. Thank you. Um, so we have another question from Hira. Um, they're asking, what um, what are some groups um, that small resource strapped nonprofits can partner with to integrate AI into their work or platforms that are already there that can be used for free or low cost? I know, Najid, you've kind of answered that already, but I don't know if you wanted to go into a little bit more detail. Yeah, so there's some really cool folks in and around the, the AI for nonprofits space. There's a ton of thought leaders. I think at Plugged In, Mal, correct me if I'm wrong, we've got the head of Microsoft's AI for Good speaking. Um, if we I do. Yeah. Yep, Rhea Sankar. Rhea, that's right. She's a, she's a badass woman and, a, and an inspiration to me. And so I, uh, you know, there are thought leaders like that who's, 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 um, social medias and, and, their, and their communities. I've got lots of access to resources. You know, there are tons of folks like N10, like the, you know, there's a whole, you know, TechSoup, whatever it might be, that are gonna have conversations about this. Um, we have some blog articles that talk about places to find great, cheap and free resources in and around the AI tech space. There are some really cool consultants. There's a woman in California, I think her name's Maria, that I've spoken to a few times that really helps nonprofits build custom tech um, with uh, artificial intelligence. So, you know, between the resources that are available on things like N10 and TechSoup and Kila and the really amazing people, uh, there are tons of places to go. And, and you know what I'll do is I'll make sure that Inez and Mel and the team at Kila pull some of those resources together and make sure we share it with the folks on this, on this, uh, on this, in this conversation. We can absolutely do that for them. Um, it looks like we have another question that just came in. Um, they're saying, do you feel a lot of conservation nonprofits struggle in the technology and IE space? So I'm assuming that one's for either Kate or Justin, if you want to chime in there. Uh, yeah, I can chime in here. And I definitely can't speak for all conservation nonprofits here but generally my my feeling going into this field and being in this field for almost 10 years now is that it is it does feel like a distant reach especially with the ai bringing that in and there are some nonprofits and some conservation tech focused groups that are doing a really good job at making that more accessible to groups that may feel like it's out of their reach especially within the ed tech space and conservation education, I noticed a big gap in terms of what is available out there and then what is actually reaching the conservation education space. And that's definitely a gap we're working to fill because conservation education is vitally important at this time and needs time-saving, energy-saving innovations that are existing in the education technology space. Thanks, Kate. That was great. Um, I don't know if there's any more questions that have come in. I, can't, I haven't seen any um, other ones come in. So um, with that, I think we will maybe end it there. There is only a few more minutes left anyways, unless um, you wanted to kind of um, go over anything in a little bit more detail, any of you three. Um, Thank you so much, Justin and Kate, for sharing their Global Conservation Course story. It was wonderful, and we wish you well in all the work you're doing. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you all for joining. Uh, if you have any questions, please, please feel free to send me an email. Um, uh, I'm happy to answer any questions that I can. Awesome. Thanks, Nadine. Yeah. We really appreciate it as well. Same to us. You guys can uh, stay safe and questions. healthy, everybody. Keep those smiles on your faces. Take care. And before we go, sorry, um, just a reminder that our next session today will start at 12 noon PST or 3 p.m. EST today. So that's in about half an hour. Um, this Lunch and Learn session titled AI for the Little Guy will be led by Peter Cragen and Lee Sutton from Kila. And if you haven't already registered for that, um, I'll post a link right now into the chat box. Just give me one second here. Um,
and I hope you all have a lovely day. Um, here is the, the link. Sorry, that took me, oops. Sorry, that took me a bit. Um, thank you all so much. Thank you all. Appreciate Bye. it. Bye. Bye.